Why do I always get stuck with crazy men? Man. Because that's the only kind that's left. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rowling. Each episode of The Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. Just a note, whether the film is a classic or a more contemporary title, this will be an in-depth discussion that will include explicit plot details and potential spoilers. We're at episode 133, back to Cole's choice, and I think you've picked something pretty gentle, pretty (laughs) middle-of-the-road, haven't you? Today we are talking about Rolling Thunder from 1977, and that's directed by John Flynn and stars William Devane, Linda Haynes, Tommy Lee Jones, James Best, Luke Askew, and Dabney Coleman. And it was written by Paul Schrader and Haywood Gould. It's about a Vietnam veteran who returns home after being held in a POW camp for several years, and soon after his return, his wife and son are killed, and he is maimed during a home invasion. After he recovers from that event, he sets out on a mission of revenge. Well, right away, when I see that production detail, Samuel Z. Arkoff and AI, (laughs) I know we're in for a good time. American International Pictures never disappoints. Much like we love to see the RKO logo come up, I feel just as passionate about the AI logo as well. And you're right, with Arkoff's name, we know we are in good exploitation hands. Before we get started here, do you know about the Arkoff formula? No, never heard of that. Using the letters of his last name, he laid out all the elements you need for a good exploitation film. A, obviously for action. R, for revolution. I'm with you so far. K, what do you guess K is? Kindness. <laughs> K for killing. Oh, okay. If I had thought of it, I might have come up with that one. Here's the surprising one. O for oratory. Oh, I was expecting orgy after that. F for fantasy. And then, likely your favorite, another F for fornication. Yeah. I think we have all of those elements in here, right? Does it seem right to you? Is there anything left out? I'm scrolling back through the little memory bank. I think we're pretty good to go. We actually kind of kick off with some oratory. We do. And not so much revolution to begin with, I guess. All that other stuff happens in between here. But to start off, we have this folky opening tune and this feeling of jubilant homecoming. It is a very mellow, 70s, easy feeling for such an intense movie to start with. It really seems to be capturing that feeling of small-town American life Basically, that's the only one that I knew, so it feels pretty true to life to me. Yeah, the city of San Antonio welcomes you home. I think San Antonio is a really good choice for this setting, actually. You've got proximity to the border. Outside of Austin, Texas is kind of a conservative state. I'm sure it was even more so then. So San Antonio, especially at the time, does have that small town feeling that you're talking about. I really like San Antonio. Austin, Houston, and Dallas, they get all the attention all the time. But San Antonio is cool. I pull for it as the underdog of major Texas cities. It's just the right size for something like this. You can believe that everybody would be rallying around and would have remembered this guy. And I like seeing it turn up as a backdrop in all kinds of movies. Cloak and Dagger, which we've done before. Pee-wee's Big Adventure. All the way back to one of the biggest early American films, Wings, was shot there in 1927. Pee-wee's Big Adventure did show us that it is the city of heartbreak sometimes. (laughs) But you believe that people would come out with banners Mm -hmm. and be talking about God, and you would see a kind of mix of people, definitely sort of the middle to lower middle class. Yeah. Austin changes so much, but San Antonio doesn't, I don't feel like. We were just there not too long ago, actually, visiting the Alamo, and the missions there that are World Heritage Sites, it doesn't feel all that different from what we're seeing here in 1977. And you could walk into a number of restaurants that look like where Linda works, for example. And like you say, our POWs arrive, and Devane makes that speech, and he tells the crowd that God and faith in our families kept us going. Now, going into this for the first time, based on the title and what you knew about its reputation, did this open the way you expected 
Well, I didn't know anything about it going in. And I don't know about you, but the first thing that I heard was JFK's voice Mm. coming out of Devane's mouth. Yeah, I have exactly the same note. So it made me think something about the character that I had to then reflect on. Is that going to be the person that I think he is? And, you know, if I had thought about the whole exploitation background, I wouldn't have expected this slow and deliberate setup of basically the entire first third of the film. And evidently, the director, John Flynn, was very specific about the pacing had to be exactly like that. Because it's essentially a human family drama in the backdrop of a war homecoming. But then I think about the title, and it seems like something cataclysmic is going to be happening. But I think it's such a credit to the film that it doesn't proceed at that pace with all of this ominous foreshadowing. I'm going to get a little bit poetic here. It's like rolling thunder itself through the darkness, moving, coming closer towards us, and it's going to have different impacts wherever it lands. I think they're bringing it with them as well, Tommy Lee Jones and Devane, because it has already deeply affected both of them in different ways, you can tell. When we see them coming in on the plane as they approach the airfield, Jones is hesitant. He projects this deep void to me. He looks to me like he's going to vomit. Yeah, exactly. And then in addition to that, I feel in him this feeling of nothing to come home to. I was worried that maybe something terrible was waiting for him. Mm. And I'm half right because Franklin (laughs) from Texas Chainsaw Massacre is one of his relatives. We'll talk more about that at the end. But Devane is exactly the opposite. He is preparing. He has the bearing of a leader. And it's such an efficient scene, I think. It sets up their dynamic in 10 seconds, and then it lets that reverberate throughout the rest of the film. Jones does have family waiting for him, like you say, which was a surprise to me the first time I saw it. I anticipated him to be completely alone. It's kind of a surprise that then is not a surprise if you start to think about who he is, this young guy from Texas who probably would have gotten married young. Yeah, when I think about it and extrapolate, that marriage is exactly like enlisting. I've got nothing else better to do. This is how it ends up. Still, though, when he left for the war, I assume he wasn't so bereft of hope or connection. I like how he offers Devane this portentous invitation to El Paso, which will come into play later. Everything to come is set up so quickly and clearly. Interestingly, I think, Schrader thought the casting should have been flipped. He wanted Tommy Lee Jones to be the lead. They said, you've given the lead the friend part. I can definitely see why he would have preferred that. Jones is much more a Schrader-type protagonist, especially at that time. Knowing that, do you lean one way or the other? I think of Jones's character as becoming his father, who we do see. And they're the ones who had the connection. I think it's incredibly telling that at one point he says goodbye to his daddy in that very specific Southern way. And like his dad, he reminds me of that dad in some of my friends' lives. I don't know if you had the same kind of person around, the one who sits in the recliner in the living room playing the television really loudly with no lights on and never talks to anybody. Something I read likened him to living in a closet in his soul. It's this enigma on the periphery that I don't know how to handle. Well, Jones sure would have been better probably at expressing that hollowed out single mindedness, that isolation. He certainly has that thousand yard stare down. That's for sure. Jones's gaze just looks through everyone. But I think Devane turns his gaze inward is what the difference is between these two guys. And that's not to say Devane does a bad job as Charlie. He definitely has that charisma, exactly that Kennedy thing that you're talking about. That's why he was cast in those parts. He's incredibly level and sympathetic throughout the entire first act of this movie. So seeing the finished product as we have it now, I wouldn't have changed it. We already have Taxi Driver, and I don't think it would be as interesting to have a second film from Schrader that hews so closely to that first one. I think Devane makes it clear that Charlie is the one, the only one maybe, who learned to love the rope and could put that face on to trick you but is completely eaten away inside. Well, Charlie's family is here too to greet him. Plus one, family friend and local law enforcement officer Cliff is behind the wheel of the car, ordering Charlie's son around a little bit. His wife makes up this feeble excuse that 
Cliff drove us out. Uh Uh-huh. Charlie, obviously, from the beginning, is having trouble transitioning back home, which gives him an excuse not to stay in the house with everyone. But he's wise to the goings-on between his wife and Cliff, quite obviously. I get the feeling that because of the length of his service and captivity together, that he and his wife were apart for much longer than they were ever together. Thankfully, and I think quite remarkably for a film like this, no one behaves unreasonably about this either. I also love this touch, and I'm sure that this appealed to you too. There's no underscoring in this scene when they are having this very pivotal conversation. Yes, absolutely. This is yet another film this year for us that employs music really effectively. So really, all that you have is Charlie's wife filling in the gaps when he doesn't talk. It's very appropriate and subdued, I think, for the situation. I think most of all, I just appreciate his response when they're going through all this. He just flatly says, I don't think I can take any more of this. Because they've gone to a deeply honest place here, which is not, you know, full disclosure, but it's enough. Can she be faulted for any of this, considering that she probably thought he was dead for years? I find it hard to think of any of these kinds of wartime situations as being something that comes down to fault. So no, I don't think so, because we're human beings. I think it's interesting that we don't quite ask the same question of the men and what they may have done overseas. Do you mean in terms of murder or infidelity? I was thinking more of infidelity, (laughs) since we're just on that topic. And the film doesn't have to go there. It's just something that seems to fall on her shoulders. She does confess it right away, and I really think this is a very mature handling of what must have felt like an inevitability to a lot of these POWs. The effect of that feeling I don't think can be overstated. So much of survival in an extreme situation like that has to be wrapped up in this having a light at the end of the tunnel. No matter what they do to me, at least I have this thing whatever it is, waiting for me as long as I can survive this. If the consensus of everyone trying to get through this is things aren't going to be the same when or even if we get home, we are being forgotten literally as we sit here. Man, that is heavy to deal with. And it leads us right to the big question overall that all of them must have been asking, what did we go through this for? Because it wasn't just his wife that left him behind. The whole country left them behind. What's happening in this house is just a microcosm of what is going on in the culture at large. And then there's that insult to injury aspect of it that apparently Cliff didn't go overseas and now he's rewarded this way with his wife. He stayed home and reaped the benefits of Charlie's absence and so it is a complicated and painful situation that a lot of guys came back to and that's not even talking about the flashbacks. And not just the wife, he has usurped some other territory of Charlie's. He's become a father for Charlie's son, giving him a nickname, Runt, which implies that he's been around for a long time. And there's more honest reflection here because his son doesn't know him and is trepidatious of getting to know him, I think. And Charlie plays it really beautifully as well. He's not pushing him. He's just there. His presence is there. So this is some incredibly fleshed out characterization happening. And of the two relationships, I think this is the one that is most important to Charlie. This will be the loss he feels more than anything. There's a nice scene where he discovers that his son has this little American flag that Charlie made out of whatever he could scrounge during his captivity. And I like so much that it is very quiet and modest about its patriotism. I really appreciate that. What did you think about how they handled that scene with all the iconography that's traditionally wrapped up in something like that? I was thinking about that flag along with his words in the very beginning. What he seems to at least outwardly believe, or at least that's what he's saying, that there was purpose in his involvement in the war and the war itself, and that America represents something that he feels a part of. And this little flag almost feels like a Boy Scout type of a token that a kid would create to fix on something useful to do, rather than reflecting some part of a larger machinery that he would feel great cynicism for at this point. I do think at that point I was still then hearing JFK's words, so that's 
probably the place that I went to. How about you? I think we pretty much fall in line together with this. It could have been this big jingoistic thing, obviously, but here I think it's even more symbolic as a father-son exchange. He is very intent on keeping close to this boy. He becomes heated about it in Dabney Coleman's office later when it's suggested that there could be custody issues. His response to that is the most intense emotion he displays throughout the first act of this film. It suggests to me that the boy was the light at the end of the tunnel, not America as an idea, not getting back home to my wife. It's all about his son, and that's just one more thing that he will ironically lose now that he has survived and made it home. Now, there's a neat little touch coming up here during this scene where he's presented with these silver dollars as a homecoming gift. Linda Haynes is standing in the background, and before we know who she is or that she's significant, her presence is emphasized by this pink dress that really stands out. It reminds me a lot of how Gloria Stewart talks about the way James Whale put her in that white dress to run up and down these dark hallways in the old dark house so that she stood out like a flame against that backdrop. In this locale with these colors, it makes Haynes strike me kind of like a cactus flower. Did I mention already how all of these performances are so beautifully modulated? Absolutely wonderful. And I know Linda Haynes is at the top of your list as well. Yeah, she's a big favorite. And I keep coming back to, in my head, how there are no histrionics here. It's just grown-ups dealing with a complicated situation And Charlie, especially, he just doesn't need to talk about it the same way the rest of them do. He needs something more troubling, I think. And we see the first bits of that when Cliff and Charlie are having their first real conversation about all this, and Charlie offers to demonstrate a rope torture, or more accurately, have one demonstrated on him. Because you can see that look in Cliff's eye, that kind of morbid curiosity, and Charlie says, you don't want to hear about it. Sure you do. He has lived this way for so long now, for several years, that it's just his routine. And he tells Cliff, like you mentioned earlier, you learn to love the rope. That's how you beat them. After he's put Cliff in the position of the torturer. This really is the first time we get a true inclination of what a deep, dark hole that Charlie's in. He says earlier in that scene, don't tell me I'm lucky. We don't know the half of it, what is going on in his head. Even with this psychological peril that he seems to be in though for the first third of this movie it is really hard to find fault with charlie or linda haynes for that matter she makes a pass at him he demurs he is an honorable man but he's also pacing himself things are changing so fast he needs to take his time with things unfortunately this is a grindhouse film so he's not given that time i didn't read it as honor quite so much i think that's in there but i think Also, you cannot disregard the lack of true emotion. So I don't know that he has anything to give in that respect, at least at this point in time. Well, if he needs to be tested, there is a severe one coming up because he and his family are the victim of a home invasion because a bunch of chumps saw in the news that he had been given these silver dollars and they figured it would be easy pickings. And I want to say again, after all of this time that we've spent with this family and these ancillary players, it really didn't seem like the movie was going to be about this. The family drama itself would have been a gigantic weight. Isn't James Best such an absolute creep? (laughs) And is he so good? Oh my God. And did you know he kept ice cubes in his hat so it would always look like he was sweating? Once again... The most tense situations in this have absolutely no music, and I think it's so much more effective without that music as a distraction. Charlie gives them nothing. Rank, name, serial number. So they put his hand in the garbage disposal. He still gives them nothing. And then we begin to understand, I think, even further how dark a place he is in. Before we go further, I want to talk a little bit more about this specific mangling. Okay. So evidently it was slated to be much, much, much more graphic and test audiences basically threw up and rioted and hated every single moment of it. And the director, John Flynn, took that scene to some psychiatrists to try to understand why people freaked out so much. And they said that it was basically like a symbolic castration, that home is the place where everybody's supposed to feel safest. And if you're vulnerable there, It is an incredibly disturbing thought. 
yeah, there are all kinds of films that really affect people deeply. And I don't think maybe that they understand that that's what they're responding to. Obviously, there are really difficult things to deal with in Straw Dogs, for instance, or in Inside, a fairly recent French horror film. Those things do have their terrible parts, obviously, aside from that. But it is very much that idea that I think is so troubling. It feels like a massive betrayal or transgression because home is sacrosanct. You do not violate that, or at least not in 1977 you didn't. It's traditionally held as off limits. And the home of a war hero. And then they double down on that with the murder of a child. We have taken a hard left into exploitation territory here. And then, again, you compound that darkness with this idea that loving the rope means in some way you crave the rope. You don't love something that deeply and distance yourself from it. Does it mean that you don't speak up when your wife and child are in imminent danger? I think he doesn't speak up for a couple of reasons that may be different from how you feel about it. One, he's in shock because of this wound being shoved into the garbage disposal. And two, in the scene, his son speaks up before he's able to even say anything. It is a so small a window that I don't think he has the time, nor is he in the physical condition to step in and do anything. Do you feel like a part of it is that he has nothing inside? And so it almost kind of doesn't even matter. Those stakes don't matter. He's not going to say anything at all to anybody. No, I don't feel that way at all. I feel like they're smart, these criminals, to leverage his family against that because he would do anything for that son, I feel like. He demonstrated it in a scene before, like I mentioned. It's literally the only thing that upsets him. It's the only thing that he cares about. He is just not in any shape to do anything right then. It's not in action that he is specifically chosen. He is just physically unable. I feel like there's still some level of defiance in there that I'm still kind of wrestling with. And so when people get around to watching this, I want to hear what they think about that too. Okay, so cut to the hospital. The aftermath of this. He has somehow survived, and Linda is sleeping in a chair in his room. Tommy Lee Jones comes to visit him. He's got nothing but this now. This trio is the family now. They step in here to really quickly establish that he has a surrogate for both wife and son in a way, and together they examine his hook, which means he is dealing with just one more layer of painful irony. He makes it out of Vietnam relatively unscathed, only to be mangled in his own home. He obviously can't just let this transgression slide. He's not in it a ton, but starting here, I'm beginning to think that this may be among my favorite Tommy Lee Jones performances, period, with No Country for Old Men at the very top, obviously, but this has to be top three, probably. I haven't seen the Executioner song. Where do you put that on the list? Funny you mention it. That's the other one of the trio. I need to get to that one, don't I? Absolutely. We can even watch it tonight if you want. Uh, No, thank you, (laughs) sir. Well, I like Coal Miner's Daughter quite a bit. I haven't seen Heaven and Earth either, another Vietnam story that he's in. And I'm with you at the very top with No Country. I kind of wonder, do we think that No Country is a continuation of this character in some way? He certainly is taciturn. I'll give him that. I don't think so. I don't think this character lives very much longer. I'm with you. I do think there's some echoes of it, especially in the father-son relationship that we see in both films. I think that they would make a pretty great double feature. Meanwhile, Charlie isn't giving the cops, Cliff in this case, anything. He is going to use this information for himself. Cliff says basically it's six weeks and we're getting nowhere. Now, Cliff is more agitated about this, at least on the surface, than Charlie is. Did Cliff somehow lose more than Charlie in this deal? Cliff talks about this whole idea to him. I want to get them. Charlie says that'll pass, even though we know that's not really what Charlie's thinking. I get that question about Cliff's loss here, but it's hard to feel like that's the truth when Charlie has lost everything twice, including his own soul. Well, then is that how he arrives at that position that everything passes? He has accumulated this terrible wisdom these last few years. And now a wife that he may have never known very well is dead. A son is gone that he loved maybe even more as an idea since they had almost no time together and the boy had no legitimate memories of him. So yeah, I guess maybe he has lost more than Cliff if you are counting his soul among those items. 
Because Charlie created that family, that life that Cliff was afforded from the ground up. I would argue Charlie's wife probably lost the absolute most. Yeah, I guess so. Husband, boyfriend on the side, cool kid, neat Cadillac convertible. Or maybe the son lost everything because he had the longest potential life to lead. But they're not here anymore, so... Right. When Charlie's discharged, he has no intention of meeting the doctor Monday morning, quite obviously. Returning to the house after the hospital stay, Dabney Coleman is telling him it's going to take some time to adjust. But time is something that he doesn't feel like he has at this point. And I don't even know that it would have been a possibility either way. This montage of him, this first preparing for revenge... These are the most purposeful and forceful movements we see him make. Could he ever have a purpose, again, greater than one of violence or any other purpose at all? Before I answer that question, is there any greater mark of an exploitation film than making your own sawed-off shotgun? Along with sharpening your new hook? Very true. But to get back to your question, it seems like it would take such a monumental shift for him to turn away from this purpose of violence. I can't imagine what that shift would be. The film takes place in 1973. He doesn't know at that point the war is still going to be going on for a while. He might have even gone back for another tour somehow. That's what Tommy Lee Jones is possibly planning on doing. So it seems like the only thing that's keeping him going, all that's left, is suffering at this point. I'm reminded of something that I watched kind of recently. I think I told you about this. It was Mandy Patinkin talking about his favorite line from The Princess Bride, watching as a late middle-aged man. That line about having been in the revenge business for so long that he doesn't know what to do with the rest of his life. It seems like that applies here, and it's the thing that he as a late middle-aged man was reflecting on because revenge is this dead-end road. And that brought me to another episode that we had done, Durat, back in episode 77. That entire film is built around revenge as a life's purpose, but once done, leaving nothing for this young man to then build the rest of his life around. There is that, yes, but at the time it feels so good and so necessary. At the time and uh, right for me today, (laughs) that's all I've been thinking about. So there is plenty of suffering still to come, you're right, and misery loves company, so Charlie invites Linda to Mexico, saying, I gotta go now. Her picking up and leaving like that, literally dropping everything, steel guitar in the background, this is the most 70s way to leave everything behind and get on the road that I've ever seen. All you need is a Johnny Paycheck cameo here at the bar. But I love how she's more than game to be a part of whatever crazy and dangerous scheme he has in mind. He still doesn't tell her the real reason, though, that they're going, so she's not fully cognizant of what lies ahead. Speaking of music, I love the score when they're driving at night. It's totally different. The thing I like about these scenes, and it comes up in my mind because we're talking about No Country for Old Men there as well, U.S.-Mexico border crossings are such an odd and interesting cinematic time capsule. In this case, the ease of it, how innocent and almost quaint any implied danger seems relative to now. I love to go back and look at those and see how simple a time it seems like compared to what we're living in. I've never done one by car, have you? Yeah, but it was a long time ago. So it was nothing like it is now. It's much more like what we see in this film. Anyway, we've left that tranquil, easy feeling of the first act behind. And so the whole plan now to get Fat Ed is distilled 70s revenge. He's dangling her as bait. He puts his sharpened hook through a guy's hand. There's this no-nonsense delivery that you thoroughly believe. Tell me what I want to know, or I'm just going to kill you. No bones about it. Nothing florid, no fancy threats. Just look me in the eye and know that if you don't give me what I want, you don't walk out of here. And then as they leave, when she's starting to put the pieces together, she's really had enough. She's had nothing in her life except men that have always let her down. Does Charlie let her down? How do you feel about this? Well, he certainly set her up. I totally get what she's saying because she's practically attacked herself. And this is a sin of omission, if nothing else. He hasn't told her what the plan is. I think it's a little bit bigger sin than that. Well, yeah. 
Sorry, at the very least, that's what it is. But if he tells her about it, does she behave in the way that elicits the response that he needs? If she's aware of what's happening, is it different? I think so, because when she drops everything, it's with that smile on her face. By the way, Linda Haynes has a great grin. She's got the best sheepish grin around. So I don't think she drops everything if she knows there's the sawed off in the backseat of the car. Well, based on our opening scene and what they say in the film, she doesn't have a lot of choice in the matter because crazy men are the only kind that are left in this landscape, if you believe that. I kind of do. It's them or some Bible thumpers maybe back in San Antonio. Where that leads me, though, thinking about what the culture was like at the time, I don't know how it was for you when you were young, but the idea that I feel like was sold to my generation growing up in the 70s was that Vietnam was impossible to sort out or understand. That there were no clear winners or losers, so don't even bother asking, but it was said with the shame of someone who lost. Do you remember your impressions of that when you were young? I very much do, and I tended to think of it as all losers. I don't remember thinking of anybody as winning. I can't remember the first time I became aware that my dad was a Vietnam vet and at least spent some portion of his time overseas and that he enlisted, by the way, which would have been about 1969. I do, though, remember the song Born in the USA. I remember one of our teachers bringing us the lyrics because I hadn't really paid that much attention to it before that point, before I read what it was about. And at that time, there were these other things happening in my community. We were a place where a lot of Vietnamese families came to settle post-war. We were a sanctuary city. And I had a very close friend who was from one of those families. And then later in high school, my friend was American. Her father had married her Vietnamese mother and brought her back to the States. And another layer of this, there was that show China Beach. Do you remember that show? I only saw a few episodes of China Beach. It wasn't something that we watched regularly. The Vietnam experience in our house was completely different, I think. Well, I remember a neighbor's daughter telling me that her father wouldn't watch the show because he didn't want to be reminded of what had happened. So thinking about this idea of everybody losing, it seemed like the concept to me was that there were these broken men all around and you weren't supposed to discuss things like the war or what it was like or what happened. I didn't think of my dad as being damaged in that way, but I still haven't discussed with him what happened or what he did or what he was really involved in. My father was the right age to go, but he had suffered a punctured eardrum when he was very young and so he wasn't allowed to go. It certainly doesn't feel like victory here at all, I'll say that. But the revenge plot has begun in earnest now, obviously, and Cliff comes to visit, check in on Charlie to see how he's doing, and he puts two and two together when he finds the remainder of the sawed-off shotgun barrel in Charlie's kitchen. He pulls some strings to track Charlie down. That's a conspicuous car, obviously, that Charlie's driving. Does Cliff remind you a little bit of John Sayles in this? 100%. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, he looks like him so much. It makes me very sympathetic to him because I'm such a big John Sayles fan. But Cliff isn't far behind them on this, and he crosses paths with some of the same bad guys, and he dispatches a couple of them, doing Charlie's work for him. But then he's also cut down himself. And I think his getting involved here is such a nice touch in the screenplay. It gives the film life in my imagination after the credits roll. Inserting this small detail of Cliff using departmental resources means someone knows something now. When a Texas cop turns up murdered in Mexico, it will make this infinitely more difficult for the authorities to ignore. With this, it's far less likely that Charlie will be able to just fade into the woodwork than if he had just killed some two-bit gringo hoods and then disappeared into the waving fields of alfalfa. We're definitely in the part of the picture where it's just going to be mayhem from here on out. Charlie and Linda, they find one of the guys that he's looking for. They wreak some havoc and hit the road again. And this is where she lays into him. And everything that she's saying is right. He doesn't deserve better. He's got a death wish. They actually fight physically and she stands up to him. It may be kind of a weird thing to say, considering that he was a POW for seven years. But I feel like she is worldlier than him. She knows more about things in a specific way. She's been around the block a few times. 
She understands so much about the situation. It's not that he doesn't understand it, but it's so drastically different for each of them, I think. So much of what they individually understand and need, those things are all most on display in this scene, if not completely spoken, and I really enjoy that. He knows his cell, and he knows that suffering, and her cell's just been <laughs> a bit larger and gone on for a longer period of time and involved more people. The thing that keeps coming up in my head where they have crossover, where their Venn diagram overlaps, is the things you do even though you know better. What do you think of their chemistry here? Okay, Linda Haynes could have chemistry with the lampshade. That's true. <laughs> it works. It really works. When she draws out his own smile, it feels like finally a genuine one. And I especially love towards the beginning when she takes his glasses off because that's been something that he's employed constantly to keep the world away. I feel like what I'm responding to is kind of what you're describing there. I feel like it's half just her nature. It could be anyone because she's so wonderful. But the other half of it is her response specifically to what she sees in him. She's great as the audience surrogate, I think. She is our way into this story. And she does a fantastic job. All of the doubt and frustration that she experiences with him, and even more specifically with herself, that makes her supremely relatable and sympathetic. I do think there is that thanklessness to it. It's something that a lot of us can relate to, that idea that we do want to try to fix something that's broken. We want to try to reach out. We want to try to communicate and touch someone else in a real way. And some of that has got to be filling our own void as well. Yeah, and some of that is the huge crush that I have on her because <laughs> 70s girls are the best. There is nothing better than a sun-dappled blonde in a denim chambray shirt. And she gets better looking the more worn down she gets. She said that Tommy Lee Jones and William Devane would call her greasy <laughs> the further along because it was just so hot and it worked for the character. Well, in the aftermath of this big fight, they're listening to the radio and he says, I remember that song from when I was alive. There's more truth in that than maybe even he knows. And I think how far you're willing to go with him as an audience member depends on how much credence you give this idea that there is nothing human left in him. Ultimately, I don't think he's dead or a void in that way. And that's what makes this really interesting to me. That would be easy, the lazy way out of this. But the way he relates to her belies that. He is not dead. What he is, is changed. And he doesn't have the lexicon to articulate it. He doesn't have the tools to diagnose it or treat himself. Or the idea of what to now change into. What would the second phase be? Yeah, he's a complicated character. And again, I point to how much he has come to love the rope. He does so beyond any level that it took to survive captivity. This movie is giving us far more than the average action exploitation revenge film. When he talks about this, Devane says... He sees it as a Hollywood revenge picture, but I see a whole lot more to it than that. And regarding his performance, he says, you can only be still for so long. I do agree with him on that. I like that idea a lot. Holding that emotional explosion off for as long as possible gives it maximum effect. Let's talk for a second about the returning Vietnam vet movie as a subgenre. I don't think a lot of critics were exactly ready for this at the time. Audiences too, maybe. There were a couple that predated Rolling Thunder. You've got The Born Losers, which is the film that gave us Billy Jack, which I love. Welcome Home, Soldier Boys is another one. Like Rolling Thunder, they all end in this chaotic violence. They're obviously trying to tell us something. It's a decade-long Death of the Eisenhower era that we've just lived through, basically. Or at least the death of the illusion of the American dream. Coming Home and The Deer Hunter, those were still to come. The Best Years of Our Lives is probably the obvious antecedent in terms of a nuanced look at soldiers returning home from war. But World War II and Vietnam, these are two drastically different wars in terms of how the public viewed them most importantly. Different motivations, different outcomes, and more than anything, as an extension of the public sentiment surrounding the conflict. A completely different view of the soldiers themselves. A lot of these films were obviously products of the counterculture. Does it feel to you like these filmmakers in Rolling Thunder, they specifically had a vested interest in tearing down the idea of the war hero 
Or is it something else that's happening here? Is this sympathetic or an indictment? My initial idea is that the film that we see, the finished product, it doesn't feel like it's tearing down the idea of the war hero as much as the idea of the America that they return to. Because I think that there's a lot of nuance in Charlie. There are a lot of different ways that we can see him and view him and his purpose and what was done to him. And then what he chooses to set out to do. And then back to that question that you had asked earlier, this idea of finding fault. Where do we find fault? It feels like it's more question than indictment here. Well, it's set in 73, like you said. It was written in 73 and was intended to be produced then which would have made it a much more ripped from the headlines document, but then it wasn't made until 1977. Do you think of this as more a 1973 movie than a 1977 movie? I have to go with 77. What do you think? This feels like we've had the time to let all of this ruminate in our consciousness, and this is where we're going off to now. I very much think of it as 1977, and here's why. People may not think those intervening years could possibly make much difference. But think about Iraq in our time. If you want to pick a four-year period, George W. Bush, he made his Axis of Evil State of the Union address in 2002 when Saddam Hussein was president of Iraq. Hussein was hanged in 2006. There's a four-year span for you. Wow. So think of all the things that happened in that time span and their effect on public opinion alone in both Iraq and the U.S., I think Schrader's approach to it was very definitely on the counterculture side. He didn't write Charlie as a hero or even as an anti-hero. And he didn't intend the home front to be welcoming, nurturing, or pure in any way. But what they ended up with, I think, is a much nicer, softer, much less racist version of what Schrader intended for the whole thing. It's really hard for me at this point in time to try to put myself into his mind and understand What was the point of having the characters he wrote? I guess I can sort of get it to the extent that I can get it in Taxi Driver. But in this, it just feels like it would have been completely weird and attractive to the wrong audience. We talk about that sometimes, liking something for the wrong reasons. Well, I'm glad you bring up that liking something for the wrong reasons part, because there's some of Linda's motivation here that I think is a little murky. For instance, when she is taking part in Charlie's target practice... Showing this, is this to give an idea of her having an unexamined depth or that she's all in for the violence to come? I don't read that target practice for her as violence in that kind of way, that she's displaying violence. It seems a little bit more about the unexamined violence behind those things that we learn as kids. Do you get that feeling because of the story that she tells about being the black sheep? Is that where that comes from? Yes, it's that part of the story that sort of violence is basically everywhere because it's behind something that's supposedly sort of noble, like hunting for your family's food. Well, I think we differ on this one a little bit. I think she gives away something here because as they leave, she says, in this leading sort of way, I wish we had something more exciting to shoot at. So what's she saying there? Does this mean that she's maybe trying to draw him out a little more about his plans because he simply never tells her anything? Or did that feel more to you like she's looking for daddy's approval? Is she hoping for validation to give her own violent impulses free reign? I really just felt like it was more excitement in life, period. Maybe that's just the innocence to a certain degree that I see in her face, even though she has been around. I don't think that the character was necessarily on the page imbued with that much motivation. Well, if she's looking for a clue as to what he has in mind, he's not giving it. He keeps his cards close to the vest. You're the quietest man I've ever known, she says. This is also the second time in the film that he refers to himself as dead. He acknowledges there's nothing left of him here. How do you keep going when you know that you're damaged beyond repair? Is it just to complete the mission? After revenge, then what? After revenge, I guess then nothing unless you change, but... The more I think about that idea, maybe that's just something from reading popular fiction and this idea I learned from the movies. Is there still, though, some element of hope or you just don't know what else to do than just to keep going? Because it does seem like for him, suicide would be out of the question. 
Well, interesting that you mentioned what comes next is nothing, because between them, that's the case. His dress blues are telling us that he intends this to be it. He leaves her in the motel, and this is gone, just like it always does for her. By the way, Devane wanted her to keep going on the trip, but the director nixed that. I think it's a great decision to nix that, because her life is just like it's always been, and yet simultaneously... It will never be the same. It allows those two things to live right next to each other for a moment that I think provides a lot more insight than if she had continued down the road with him. And especially when I think about how cycles perpetuate themselves and how it folds into that, because you've got Cliff being dead, but Charlie doesn't know it. Will Charlie be dead before Linda knows it? These things just keep circling around and feeding on themselves. So if she goes along for the ride, that doesn't happen in as interesting a way. And surely she would have been a casualty. I can't see it going any other way. So, leaving Linda in the dust, Charlie makes a beeline for El Paso, and here we meet Tommy Lee Jones's family, and all I have to say is fucking Franklin. <laughs> they should take him and use him as a human shield, I think. Charlie makes his pitch here to John about this mission, who is the only person, I think, that he knows who also has nothing left to lose. I'll just get my gear. Yeah, there's no hesitation there. What did Charlie do, do you think, to instill this loyalty in John? Is it just the mentor or father figure status? I'm going back to the amount of time, which was considerable, that they spent in that POW camp and their relative ages. And so I think that there's a big brother aspect, a protector, a commander, especially if you think about Tommy Lee Jones' character, that idea that you're taught in the military, the one who is in charge, is your god. I think you were on to something earlier, actually, too, when you mentioned how he only specifically says goodbye to his father. He doesn't care about anyone else that's in that room. The father-son relationship is the one with the most value in it. We see that with Devane. We see that with Tommy Lee Jones. But back to something else that you just said that just reminded me of another thing. Speaking of, you look at this person as the be-all, end-all, and military might obviously is a big theme here. Paul Schrader said they made this into a fascist film. What did he write then? I don't know. I don't get it. He set out for Charlie to be a racist, to basically go through and end up killing uh, Mexicans. I'm not sure what his purpose was. I don't know what he set out to write. The only thing that I keep coming back to is that Charlie's infallibility, I think, is the thing that maybe makes it fascist in his mind because that manipulates the audience to side with him no matter what. It could basically be propaganda in that way. Otherwise, I'm like you. I don't know. Was he trying to write a more socialist shootout in a bordello? Which is not the first time he's done that, by the way. Does he feel like it became fascist because we do want some sort of justice for Charlie and what he endured? Or because it can't be done to the Viet Cong, but it can to some rednecks? I don't really get the fascism because it's essentially, at this point, not the instrument of the state that's keeping him down. And he doesn't seem to be the instrument of the state in quite that way. I don't know. It feels very muddy to me. It won't be the first or the last time that I don't Totally get Paul Schrader's vision. <laughs> yeah. His hang-ups about sex and death and religion are something else. We could do a whole episode just about that. And he did write this right after Taxi Driver, and you can really feel the influence of one upon the other, especially when you consider that his draft differed so much from the finished product here, apparently. Interestingly, in that original draft of Rolling Thunder, there was a scene in which Charlie and Travis Bickle cross paths. They encounter each other in a porn theater. And you're right, as Schrader conceived him, Charlie was a garbage person, basically. All of Travis Bickle's worst characteristics and not much else. In this revision, though, he becomes much more of a rigidly principled anti-hero who has been irreversibly affected by the wartime experiences. 1973 versus 1977. Going back to that idea that Jones might be the better Schrader protagonist, John smiles as Charlie lays out this plan for him. He has a purpose again. One thing I wanted to ask you here, is anything they do justifiable because these guys shot his kid? Does that give them carte blanche to perpetrate any and all manner of violent atrocities? 
The wife, too. Let's not forget about her. I only mentioned the child because it seems like such a taboo thing. Yes, very true. I guess, ultimately, I'm going to be an American on the fence. I hate to be in the position of having to proclaim whether something is justifiable. Especially me right now when I am in the mode for vengeance and avenging and revenging a lot of different things. Well, as the smoke clears with this, they walk out the door injured, but under their own steam, just barely. The implication to me is that if they survive, they stand a good chance of going completely unpunished for this as long as they can get back across the border, even with a dead cop involved. Now, is that just something that we understand because we live here? Or do you think audiences in other places picked up on that? Is that strictly because we know how Texas works in relation to those things? I do want to emphasize before I answer that, that's so interesting, that finale. It makes up just a fraction of the film. It's so quick and then it's over. But back to your question. Border politics, different cultures. There's this idea that I've learned from movies. It's Chinatown, Jake. It seems like it is something that audiences may have been familiar with. So that makes it a very 70s thing, I think. Because of that, does that mean that there is an unavoidable cynicism that's built into the structure of this? Yeah, there's got to be. You can make arguments either way, I think. But I do definitely come down on that side with you once all is said and done. But the things I'm thinking about here... You take the murder of his family, for example, it happens off screen. If they really wanted to exploit that, they would have shown us, right? It wouldn't even have to be graphic, but if you render that on screen, then you can leverage that for a much more vivid and poignant motivation for this revenge mission that he goes on. And a lesser filmmaker might have depicted it even revisited in flashback. So by not showing it to us, you can say that they showed some discretion there. And then on the other hand, though, Does keeping it unseen say something larger about the lack of meaningful space they occupy in his life, which I think is where you go with this? Yeah, I go back to that question of why he doesn't speak up. What do they mean to him? What does the money mean to him? Does this all then become a symbolic journey of don't take this very last thing from me? Well, just on the surface, he's obviously very clearly only motivated to me by the loss of his son. But... Having this conversation, I begin to question even that. And ultimately, what will this even achieve? Is this just a balancing of the ledger? Because it's an empty and hollow gesture at best, and then at worst, it's just a justification on which to hang his desire to revert to his most primitive self, with meaningless violence being one of his only defining characteristics. It's not an accident that he loses a hand and replaces it with something decidedly more like a weapon. He is literally taking steps toward evolving into a more refined killing machine. It has the patina of justice this time because of who he's taking it out on. But where does that energy go next time? Because the whole point of this is not the dissolution of the family. It's the dissolution of the man. And that happened far before he ever made it back stateside. Does anything thinking about that question earlier about whether they were trying to undermine this idea or not, does anything make him a hero? What values are being defended here? It occurred to me that I think largely we, the universal we, especially Americans, maybe just Americans, I think that we value commitment and seeing something to the end, even if it's completely misguided. I think that's a very good point. It's easy to lose sight of those things in the moment. And as far as the home front goes... Charlie may not have adjusted, but Tommy Lee Jones seems to actively hold his in contempt. And who could blame him with Franklin sitting around all the time? So what are they fighting for? If they aren't heroes, are they exclusively a threat? A ticking time bomb? Is that what they're telling us? That goes back to this idea that I feel like I had ingrained in me that they're just damaged people. And if they're not damaged, they're ineffectual somehow. Kind of like Dabney Coleman's character. Or even his wife. Well, it's obviously considerably more complex than we're going to be able to handle here. There are as many different coming home stories as there are soldiers. But cinema, it always reflects our anxieties back at us from the universal horror films of the 30s on down. So I think maybe the better question is whose anxieties are on display here? The returning soldiers? The people who don't know how to help them reintegrate because this experience has now generated such a vast gulf between them? I'm reminded of something from a Buffy the Vampire Slayer (laughs) episode. I think there's this idea 
we being the people who are stateside or any of us in this sort of position, that those who come back are wrong somehow, irreparable. And that in the meantime, we've been living these petty lives, these small lives. And then add to that that there are people out there these rednecks, by the way, who value absolutely nothing. They don't value war heroes. They don't value some silver dollars. By rednecks, you mean specifically these characters in the movie, right? Yes, the okay. killers. Well, it's just unimaginable for me to think of how many people must have felt at that time, like the war was never truly going to be over. They were just kids put in a completely unreconcilable position by people with abominable motives that would never have to get near combat themselves. Well, going back to some of the questions that you've asked over the course of the episode, this idea specifically, do we see this as an indictment of America's role in Vietnam or not, as opposed to specifically, this is my question, as opposed to some critics at the time, or Paul Schrader himself? Because critics at the time, this being 1977 time, faulted it for its pacing, for its violence... And so do we as viewers so long since removed from that time see it as less of an indictment? Because I think that's where I've been coming down on that question. Then the viewers who lived through it, the 1973 viewers, the 1977 viewers. And for me, I think it's got to be the distance because I see every moment that he spends at home as being so desperately futile and poignant and sad. There was no reason to go and there's nothing to come back to. I think you said that very well. I think that encapsulates a lot of what I think about it. The part that you didn't address is the other half of the film equation of it. You take all of those things and combine that with the fact that this is 50-50 as far as a film goes. We've talked about the Vietnam vet coming home part. The other half of that just being the straight revenge picture. And it's this element that puts it firmly in exploitation territory for me. Revenge pictures were a staple of the 70s, obviously. Usually, though, at least in the most prominent examples, it was often rape revenge. That was the formula that you saw a lot. I Spit on Your Grave, Miss 45, Thriller, A Cruel Picture, Lipstick. And I think when you're talking about how audiences responded to it, I think it's that exploitation part in terms of violent revenge that they're talking about, not necessarily the underpinnings of the Vietnam War. And you're right, responses to it at the time, they regarded the violence in this as nearly pornographic. Until the finale, though, almost nothing occurs on the screen that's more rowdy than your average Burt Reynolds bar fight. But then it's that ending. It's such a massive eruption of violence that just puts an exclamation point on all this. What I am left to wrestle with is whether or not I think that the violence is inevitable and what that means to me, what that says about me as a viewer for going along on this ride. All throughout, it just gives us so much more. There is such a surprise depth to this gem. I truly feel like this is a film for all kinds of people. Art house folks, grind house folks. Somehow they just ended up making one of the greatest films of the 70s almost by accident. So the end. How about you give us a recommendation? I've got another great film from the 70s. I picked Lone Wolf and Cub, Sword of Vengeance, from 1972, directed by Kenji Misumi, with Tomi Saburu Wakayama and Akahiro Tomikawa. This was the first in the series of the six Lone Wolf and Cub films, based on the manga series of the same name. And it tells the story of Ogami Ito, who was a disgraced former executioner to the Shogun. And he is wandering the countryside, pushing a baby cart with his three-year-old son inside. We talked a bit about this idea of revenge earlier and the road that it leads to. And I think that the characters of Ito and Charlie are quite a bit alike. Ito may be already dead inside as well, but he's still moving forward. In the case of Lone Wolf and Cub, though, you've got Ito's son who makes a choice... I'll put that in quotation marks, as a toddler to follow in his father's path of this endless revenge and blood. And just like for Charlie, this path doesn't bring happiness in any form that we can recognize, and I'm not even sure about satisfaction either, and definitely not redemption. How about you? Well, my choice is Convoy from 1978, and that's directed by Sam Peckinpah, starring Chris Christopherson, Ali McGraw, 
Ernest Borgnine, Madge Sinclair, Franklin Ajay, and Burt Young. And that's all based on the song of the same name by C.W. McCall, and it's about a group of truckers that form a huge convoy in support of one of their brethren and his vendetta against an abusive sheriff. The trucker movie, that was a big 70s it's a big thing. genre. I choose it specifically because of that, because it's a look into another subset of 70s exploitation drive-in cinema, the trucker movie, and I think even more specifically, CB culture. I don't know how common it is to run into a civilian with a CB radio anymore, but it was a big deal in the 70s. C.W. McCall had a huge hit with this song in 1975, number one on both the country and the pop charts. God, it was probably playing in the hospital when I was born. <laughs> probably. And then there was a whole spate of trucker movies. Aside from this one, people are probably most familiar with Smokey and the Bandit or maybe White Line Fever. Did you have a CB growing up? We didn't, but I know some neighbors did. And yeah, I was completely aware of it. I would always say Breaker Breaker. I mean, that was definitely part of the culture. We had one and we used it all the time in the summers. My dad and his brothers, they laid tile for a living during that time. And it was how we went on vacation. They would get a job somewhere. We would go as a huge group. They would work during the day and we would vacation while they did this job. All of my immediate and some extended family we would go on the road together, travel all over the country, and keep in touch throughout the day with the CB radios that we all had in our vehicles. I recommend this movie mainly as an interesting artifact, a time capsule of what now seems a little like kind of an improbable time. Where it succeeds most, I think, is probably the obvious Christofferson's charisma. It does take some of Peckinpah's stock themes, that whole anti-authoritarian thing, an iconoclast navigating the American West where independence and the way of life you've known is slowly disappearing. But it tacks that stuff onto essentially a movie full of big set pieces full of chases and explosions. It doesn't all work, I would say. It's kind of a mishmash, but as uneven as it was, it was Peckinpah's greatest commercial success, which is incredible. That was the power of the trucker and the CB in 1978. Check it out and take a look at a window into a different time. So once again, that's two great recommendations, Lone Wolf and Cub, Sword of Vengeance, and Convoy. And that brings us to the end of episode 133. First and foremost this time, we want to say a very special thanks to Ron Kompestein for becoming our newest Patreon supporter. Thank you very much, Ron. We appreciate that a great deal. If what we do here is valuable to you and you would like to support that, we would certainly love for you to take a look at our Patreon at patreon.com slash magic lantern. The $5 a month level, it gets you access to a big backlog of bonus episodes, and those come out on the Mondays alternating with regular episodes, so you never have to go a week without new magic lantern in your life. If you would just like to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magic lantern podcast at gmail.com. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast on any of those platforms. We're on Twitter, at Lantern underscore cast, and I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. Laura Cannon and the Fatal Films podcast, Drew Tavendale and the Fine Gentleman at Fuds on Film, Jeff Duncanson, Doug McCambridge over at Good Times Great Movies, Chris Polly, Jake Lindbergh, Brian Sauer, Mike Scharf, Carrie Mernion, Jonathan Malott, David Parker, Richard Sales, Mick Erdley, Joe Bridges, and Leanne Kubich. If you're sharing the show or talking about us, please make sure to tag us so we can say thanks. I also want to thank Matt and Travis at The Complete Podcast for having me on to do the entire Three Colors trilogy one film at a time. So go over there and check that out. We're on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, just about anywhere you get your podcasts you can find us. Special thanks this time to Nick Licata for leaving us a very nice review on iTunes. We certainly appreciate that. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review via any of those services, we would be very grateful. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, at the website magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. <laughs>